So we're back here with Poly Talks and Rye Relationships at Hacienda Villa, and we're off for the second portion of this evening's conversation. So, of course, we have Janet Hardy once again. Hello. Yay. And I'd like them to introduce themselves here. We have Atrina. Hi, my name is Atrina Brill. I am a non-traditional relationship and sexuality and gender educator, activist, and researcher. Um, yeah, that's me. You're so modest. You know, a lot of this event is thanks to you, right? This all started when we were at Berkeley in February of last year, and a, a full 20 months later, here we are. Yeah, exactly. And we were back in my stomping grounds, actually, where I did my undergrad at UC Berkeley at the uh, non-monogamy conference there. And um, we got along, started talking about like our common interests. And I was like, well, when you come to New York, hit me up because I definitely have a community out here. So thank you to the Villa and the Hacienda community for helping out with this because it's awesome so far. Fantastic. And Andy, can you introduce yourself? Yeah. So, OK, my name is Andy or more recently at Legally Andrelea. Um, my, I'm one of Atrina's partners. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention that. This is one of my core partners here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, you might hear me meow on occasion. I'm kind of a cat, that's the thing. But um, yeah, so what I'm doing here, um, I am a polyamorous woman who came to find her gender, her polyness, her kink, all these things um, over the course of the last five or six years within um, a really beautiful uh, community that exists here in New York City. And I sort of, um, I've done a lot of thinking about um, the fact that, um, so professionally I'm a musician and um, I'm in a very fortunate place as far as trans women go uh, in that my narrative doesn't mimic the traditional um, tragic narrative that we tend to hear so frequently. Um, I've had a beautifully supportive community. I have beautifully supportive partners. And um, I feel like the best way that I can, the best thing I could do with that is give that, uh, give that back to the community, pay that forward. So I've been wanting to um, speak on my uh, um, experiences and share that. And this is the first step for that for me. So wonderful to have you here. I really appreciate it. Uh, in the in the first part of this evening, I mentioned how uh, I believe dichotomies and binaries are inherently false, and and there's we had an interesting uh, conversation about this uh, back in March in Los Angeles. Uh, I believe you described yourself as an untransitioned trans man. Um, sort of, kind of, uh, you know. Exactly. Yeah, I'll, I'll definitely own gender queer. Um, yeah, if I were 20 years younger, I would I would be looking seriously at transitioning, but it seems sort of, you know, when, once you're wearing the cesarean scars, it seems a little past past the point of doing that sort of thing. Um, it, you know, I'm in a relationship with someone who doesn't care what gender I am, and I'm not looking for other relationships, and everybody who cares about me knows how weird I am, and I, I just don't see any reason to present differently to the outside world than I do. Yeah, I, I'm in a similar boat also. Um, I definitely identify as genderqueer, and my gender definitely presents as very cisgendered, um, as I most often uh, identify, or I most often present as femme, uh, but inside I definitely feel like a somewhere between a cross-dressing man and a trans woman, depending on how inherent my femininity feels to me. Um, but it's definitely beyond the norm, and it's really nice to talk to people <laughs> who have experienced uh, non-binary gender expression or feelings um, or experiences and things like that, which is one of the reasons I really, really value and appreciate my, um, my partners who are uh, not cis, uh, specifically because they really just understand where I'm coming from, not just that my cis partners don't but there is a special sort of uh thing that happens when you can really talk about these sort of issues with your partners and they understand that um actually brings me something that i was hoping to um relate which is i find that a beautiful thing about being polyamorous is that in having partners of all different kinds of backgrounds and all different kinds of genders and gender expressions and sexualities and kinks and personalities um you end up having an opportunity to really discover who you are differently with each person. Like, um, 
you know, the, the thing that I, the reason why jealousy never really seems to be a thing for me is because, um, I feel like the idea that someone could replace a relationship that you have with a, with a given person is a complete fallacy. And, um, be, because every dynamic is so unique. Every dynamic not only is unique in that dynamic, but brings out a completely different um, quality in oneself within that. Like with Atrina, I'm a huge brat, which I am not with any other partner of mine, right? So like... <laughs> oh, joy for you. Don't worry, she gets punished for it. But point being, um, you know, um, with your gender queerness, right? I've one thing that I really value in our dynamic is how I've been able to help you explore that and the the means of gender expression that you and I find a lot of my partners end up being able to unlock in themselves that are outside of where they had really had an opportunity to explore previously in dynamics that they've had, and that's a beautiful thing about being poly. I really agree with that idea. You know, I, I, um, I often refer to humanity as like individual diamonds that have thousands of facets, and you, you, you reflect a lot of what you encounter. And uh, different partners bring out different sides of me, not necessarily different genders within me, but different aspects of my personality and an emphasis on different uh, personas and moods. And sometimes I have to end a relationship because I don't like who I am when I'm in a relationship with this person. You know, so often when I think about my most successful and lasting and intense relationships, it's because I like who I am when I'm with this person. And when I decide it's over, it's like, ooh, I'm being really gross. I got to go. Like, it's almost like I am leaving more than dumping them. Yeah, my, that's actually one of the biggest words of wisdoms that my mother has ever given me is um, to like really judge the value of a relationship, spend a lot of time investigating how you feel and how you are and who you are in that relationship. And that really determines its health for you. And, and I think back to when I was monogamous as well. I was a maniac when I was monogamous. Like I was so possessive and jealous and I got to enforce every rule and every little thing disrespects me. And it was like, this is this is not who I want to be, you know. So I want to I want to get this open to the floor. There is a question upstairs. Uh, can you hear us up there? Loud and clear. Great. Here we have a question from Jeremy on the first floor. Great. Thank you. I, I, I was hoping to connect some of the dots between the discussion that was happening in the first chunk, and it's great to have new people to kind of explore it. Um, there was a lot of exchange around what is a barrier to mainstreaming or access to polyamory? And there's also a lot of discussion about more complex models of consent that aren't based on blame. And I think one of the places where those ideas are connected that we haven't talked so much about yet is about some of the inherent issues around present day polyamory and privilege. Um, I know there's maybe an opportunity, like. In, in, in BDSM culture, I think there's this really great opportunity to make apparent asymmetries of power and to help people have a very conscious experience of power. But so much of the rest of our lives, there's just ex unconscious experiences of power. And sometimes these asymmetries in power in our lives in terms of race, class, uh, gender, um, all sorts of other things um, can really affect our ability to engage in, say, polyamorous relationships or can really affect, in some cases, our ability to feel safe with our, our own needs for consent. So that seems to me to be one of the big barriers and one of the big issues that are coming up. So I wonder if you all can talk a little bit about these issues of, of privilege and access as they come up in terms of polyamory. Whoa. <laughs> Somebody doesn't know their own power up there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that, that's it's a huge list of topics that have been brought up there. We've got privilege, we've got power, we've got race and gender, and I imagine uh, class as well. Most definitely. Um, I think it's it's pretty typical in any kind of social movement that it's going to be most visible 
through the media because, um, because what the media sees is the privileged edge of it. Um, getting um, being adapted. Uh, Melina talked a little bit about this. It's not like we're inventing polyamory here. We are not inventing polyamory here. Um, polyamory has been around for all of humankind, and in some cultures you talk about it more, and in some cultures you talk about it less, but it's always been here. Um, but we in this room, who are for the most part uh, fairly privileged people, we are the ones who are getting seen by the media. And so we are the ones who are dictating the narrative about Polly. Um, and that's where the privilege comes in. But the, the good part is that we are also opening doors by, by communicating that narrative and making it safer for people who are perhaps not lucky enough to be able to afford to live in a communal household in, in Brooklyn um, or who have other issues keeping them away from perhaps finding the kind of life they want. We're showing them that it can be done. And we're making it possible for people who come after us to do it more easily. It's getting pretty common these days when I speak to younger audiences on college campuses that I'm talking to second generation poly people. In one case, I was talking to a third generation poly person, which was amazing. Um, and so it, I, I'm going to be fascinated to see what kind of world these people build when they don't have to fight their way upstream through all the prejudices and judgments and shouldas that we do. If they can start from a clean slate and build relationships the way they want to. Yeah, adding to Janet's comment, um, I think the term polyamory is um, very, uh, very white centric, very upper middle class centric. Um, it's, it's a term that does hold a little bit of marginalization. And I feel that perhaps, uh, so studies have shown that um, people who identify as polyamorous and as swingers as well uh, tend to be upper middle class or like middle class to upper middle class, well-educated white people. Um, there, there is variation within that, of course, but that is the, the typical norm that we see. And I think a lot of that has to do with taking on an additional marginalized identity. So for people who already have a marginalized identity that they're working with, um, navigating through the world with, to take on an additional label that's going to further marginalize them might you know, pose additional threat to their well-being and their safety. Um, yeah. One of the things I've noticed is that um, the majority tends to dominate all things unless you greatly actively change those percentages uh if you'll notice i'm the only straight white guy on a stage that's on purpose that's absolutely on purpose um the, that's kind of the worst thing i could do as far as exerting my power and privilege would be to fill this stage with dominant straight white men what would be the point of that you know might as well just have me i'll just stand up here by myself so I've, I've done my best to, to show a diverse array of opinions, not only in the opinions themselves, but by the people who are saying them. And, you know, the more visibility that we can give to everyone, the more everyone will feel welcome. Do we have more questions? Okay, uh, we've got two in the back and then... We have a question in the backyard. Can we take that? Um, <laughs> well... <laughs> There's a lot of rooms in this space. We'll take that and then bring the mic back down to the main stage here. I have Kitten here who would like to ask a question. Hi. Um, so I, I have a question in regards to uh, scarcity. Sorry, I can hear my own echo. This is really weird. And um, Put a finger in your ear. <laughs> I am trying. Could someone fill the other ear, please? <laughs> Sincerely. Thank Get one person for each okay. year. No, I'm, I'm good. Okay. It's more non-monogamous right. that way. <laughs> so in terms of scarcity and abundance, uh, one of the major abundances I see in BDSM is s &M. And one of the major abundances I see in gay men culture is anal. So as somebody who identifies as a kinkster and as gay, who is not into S&M and is not into anal, it's a little difficult to, main, uh, uh, to like navigate those worlds. So like, what's a good way in terms of like addressing those lack of interests in areas that a large percentage of those groups are interested in? 
if I got to wave my magic wand over all the alt sex communities, what I would do is take away all our nouns and make us use our verbs. Because the nouns fuck us up every time. If, if you say, I'm a kinkster, that can mean anything from I wear my high heels in bed through, you know, I spend my, I met a guy once who had built piercings behind his Achilles tendons because he liked to be hung upside down from a meat hook. Um, and anything in between, if you say I'm Polly, that can mean, you know, my wife and I, for our anniversary every year, we hire a hooker to, you know, I'm the sweetheart of the Seventh Fleet. Um, and when we use our verbs, we can say, I like X, I don't like Y, sometimes I enjoy Z, but only with certain people under certain conditions, um, and you look really good to do W with. Um, verbs are just, you know, I, you can hear that I'm, I'm a writer here because verbs, <laughs> verbs are what make your writing good too, but they also make, make your life work better. If you talk about what you like to do, what you don't like to do, what you don't want to do under any circumstances, what you may consider, that gets a lot simpler. I think we're also getting into definition and the negative. You know, even the big umbrella term of non-monogamy is defining things and what it's not. And that's kind of what I'm hearing in your statement of defining a lot of your limitations as being uh, inherent to your limits in the world, like how much abundance you can find as opposed to, let's say, if you emphasize the things that you like and seeking that out primarily, and, and, and then trying to gather community around those specific things that you like, whether it be identifying as a cat or anything else, you know, whatever it could be. If you emphasize what you are instead of what you're not, you may have more success. I can speak to that a little bit. Um, I, when I was first starting to explore the possibility of coming out as my gender, um, I was talking to my family about this a lot. And um, my father, basically, what he had to say about it was essentially like, okay, I get this is who you are, but, um, you know, why does everyone else have to know that, right? Um, why do you have to put out to the world that you are a woman? Um, you know, wh why can't you just, like, do that in private and then, you know, because he basically, his, I, I understand where he was coming from and was a very loving place, which was a place of concern. He was concerned that if I put myself out there as I am, um, there would be all this backlash from the world, right? That um, I'd be financially dependent on him forever because I'd never be able to get a job. Um, that I would, um, you know, be victimized, that I would be all of these things, right? And, you know, this was a concern that resonated with me for a long time. Uh, but basically, where I eventually ended up was I realized that the areas of my life in which I presented myself as I am um, and in which I wasn't afraid to just put out there what I wanted, who I was, um, are the areas of my life that were satisfying, that were whole. And I found that as... Um, I started to come out um, in, you know, I, uh, as I started to come out in the workplace um, professionally um, amongst people who I wouldn't have necessarily thought would be amazingly supportive or what have you, that um, that started to allow me to, um, like, those, those parts of my life, it was automatically a million times more welcoming than had been when I was shutting down, when I was, like, being... Um, you know, just trying to present to something I wasn't. So to get back to what you were saying about um, how when, um, you know, it's difficult to like put out like, okay, um, I'm a gay man who doesn't like anal or like, okay, I'm um, a kinkster who doesn't like S&M, right? Um, yeah, it's difficult to put these things out there about like what you do like when you don't think that what you do like is what the mainstream is going to support. But the more you put yourself out there like that, um, I find that so long as you're not threatening to who people are by like imposing on them or something, um, that it's uh, that people tend to be very supportive of people being confidently and happily who they are and that the more you put yourself out there like that the more that you have an opportunity to connect with people along those realms that actually work for you uh, another point i'd like to make is that one of the ways being poly is actually supportive to those of us who don't necessarily fit into the mainstream of whatever it is we are is we don't have to be someone's everything 
Um, if you don't like getting spanked, then you go, hey, you know, I'm not into that, but it would be totally cool with me if you went and found yourself someone who loves being spanked. Um, so we're, we're not putting ourselves under this kind of pressure that some monogamous people do to meet all of our partner's needs. We're, we're by definition, in a situation where um, we can send them somewhere else to do that. I was in a very long-term relationship with someone whose primary kink is bondage, which I can take or leave. And my primary kink is um, impact play, which he didn't care for. So I called his other partners his, his pretzels, and he called my other partners my chew toys. And, <laughs> and we, we were very happy that way for a long time. And I, I think about the things that I'm not into and, and, and what those when that actually impacted my relationships, like some, some very vanilla things even. For example, I hate morning sex. I hate it. And that like knocks out a whole lot of women that are, would otherwise be interested in me. Cause like, that's my favorite thing. It's like, I can't, I can't function. I got a headache. I got all kinds of problems. It's not gonna work for me. I also don't like being woken up with blowjobs. And I've had some very disappointed partners. Like, can I please? It's like, no, don't wake me up, please. <laughs> Leave me alone. You know, and, and, and if you just emphasize all the things you don't like, man, that's a long list. There's a whole <laughs> lot of stuff that people love doing that I hate doing. A lot of it. <laughs> yeah, I definitely think, yeah, owning the yeses that you have and focusing on those, like what sort of things are you into as opposed to what are the, what are the sort of things that you're not into will definitely get you more of that what you want instead of like the anti-model. Do we have the mic back down here? Great. So I saw a handful of questions in the back here. Let's get to those. Where are the hands? Yeah, I believe you were first. Hi. Um, I'm so happy to be here, and I'm so glad that this panel is here because I was just telling my primary partner at the break that, you know, it's I'm bisexual, and, and it's interesting that sexuality hasn't come up. And I know that this is more of a, you know, gender, um, gender orientation versus sexual orientation, but... I just, I, I have experienced bias from the, both the straight and queer community being a bisexual person. And I'm bisexual through and through, like 50-50 on the Kinsey scale. And, you know, I just wonder how, how many other, how does that play in a poly community? Because, you know, I'm newly poly um, out of a long-term relationship with a woman. And I'm wondering, like, what are others' experiences with... Um, being with straight partners, but possibly being, you know, bisexual. I would say bisexuality is, if not normative in poly land, very close. It's, uh, w there are many, many more bi and sometimes pansexual identified people in, in poly land than in monogamy land by far, and much more acceptance than, than you find elsewhere. I'm seeing nods from the audience. I'm not the only one who thinks this. Yeah. I think notably this is um, really commonly found in bisexual women. I think there still is a sort of um, stigma or, um, you know, it's a little more underground, the, you know, bisexual men. They're there, of course, um, but I think in like smaller numbers or maybe less visible numbers. It, it, it may have to do with which subsector of, of the community you're in. In, in swing community, and notoriously, uh, bisexual men are often unwelcome. Um, in BDSM leather, Lots and lots of men are bisexual, and even more are by bi, bi SM. Uh, so it's it's an easier place. I, I think the the moral to all this story is that once you recognize yourself as a weirdo in one aspect of your life, the next time you find out that you're a weirdo in another aspect of your life, it gets a little bit easier, and then they just go down like dominoes. <laughs> yeah, I um I kind of um. I very much agree with those things, especially your assessment of, um, you know, how the swing community can be pretty shut down on that. Um, and what I what I find is that different spaces have different, um, like uh, there are a lot of people out there who identify as polyamorous, right? Um, there are a lot of different communities that focus um, on different um, lifestyles that happen to have polyamory incorporated into them. Um, I think that um, depending on where you are, you find things that either are very heteronormative areas of um, polyamory, like for instance, the swing community, or um, 
you know, I could think of a few other examples, but that's a good example. Um, or you find yourself at places like, um, there are a number of parties that um, on the other end of the spectrum are essentially queer exclusive, right? Um, parties where, um, and, and like even further off the tipping points of that, there are some parties that I could think of that have a sort of queerer than thou attitude to them, right? Where like basically like unless you um, ex explicitly fit their mold of what a queer person is, you don't belong there, right? Um, but I think that where I like to, what I find is wonderful about um, the communities that um, for instance, that host uh, that are a part of hosting um, this talk right here is that while yes, there are a lot of, there is a lot of heteronormative stuff that happens at um, a, a, a lot of heteronormative contingents within that community. At the same time, I've never, as a queer person, felt even remotely out of place there. I felt. Um, you know, I felt really beautifully accepted. I've found lots of people w um, within these communities that fall within that realm as well. So I think that the key is figuring out ways to create inclusivity. And I think that what you'll find is that if you find the right groups of people, um, there's beautiful amounts of inclusivity to be had in the poly communities. Um, I can also speak a little bit as my experience with, as um, I identify as pansexual, but um, not to say that bisexual is any less, you know, valuable of a term. Um, that's just how I personally identify. Um, there, there are a few issues that I have found that have come up. Um, for example, one of my um, first adult polyamorous relationships was with a heterosexual man who uh, said, I don't mind if you have sex with women, but don't have sex with men. One the, yeah, penis the one policy. penis policy, the ever present, right? Um, and while I'm sure this situation does work for some folks, what I found for myself was that when I turned on the I'm interested in meeting new people, I couldn't designate I can only be attracted to certain people. It was like either I had that on or I suppressed it. Um, and it wasn't that it ever went away. It was whether I acted on it or not. And I found that when the option was presented, I could have sex with women um, but I could not have sex with men that I had no interest in only having sex with women. Whereas when I, you know, am allowed to, well, not allowed, but when it is within my relationship perimeters to, uh, engage with whatever gender I wanted, I much, much greater, like much more enjoyed my sex and my time and my relationships with women, um, because I could value them for what they were. And it wasn't that I was like, okay, well, this is my only option. It wasn't that scarcity model of like, I'm only allowed to have a woman. So therefore, you know, I'm going to have to enjoy it whether I like it or not, <laughs> you know? Um, so that was, that, that was one thing that came up for me. I, um, I have trouble identifying with a specific term anymore because when I, research the histories of these terms, I get pretty uncomfortable. Like if you, you know, most people consider me a heterosexual man, but that really enforces a gender binary, which uh, is not something I want to do. Uh, a lot of people would say straight, but straight has a very torrid history of legalities and stuff. I mean, there, there was points where it's like you were a criminal or you were straight. You know, you're on the straight and narrow. You know, there were points where straight meant you were vanilla and, and people who are not straight were kinky in, into BDSM. So it's, it's, it's a word that keeps getting changed, and it's, it's got all kinds of weird things. Uh, I've heard femoromantic recently. <laughs> femoromantic means yeah, you're attracted to the feminine. Yeah. yeah. You know, um, there's a lot of terms out there. Iron thing, you're attracted to iron? Yeah. <laughs> pharaoh romantic. That'd be pharaoh. Uh, so... So I, I think back to two incidences. One was a few years ago, um, I, I had went to a Korean spa for the first time in Los Angeles. And I loved it. I loved it. But I realized I can't take a date there because everything is gender segregated. You know, you, you, it's nude in the jacuzzis and hot rooms and saunas. And so they segregate that. And there's only certain parts that are uh, all genders welcome. And so I was like, you know what? American men need to loosen up. I'm going to invite 500 dudes on Facebook to go with me to the spa. One showed up. One. 
and I got a stalker out of it because he was certain that, he, that, that I wanted to fuck him. He was certain it was all. I invited 499 other people just to fuck that guy. <laughs> uh, and that got, that got crazy. So it's like, you know, uh, and, and, and then most recently I was the, the house dom, house top at a fetish event in Los Angeles, the LA Fashion and Fetish Ball. And there are photos of me uh, aggressively flogging a man. And he's shirtless, and his back is red, and he had a great time. It was his first scene. He insisted that he was a heavy, and, and we checked in regularly, and it went pretty heavy and changed his life. You know, a lot of high fives. And photos of that went up online, and people were like, Rye, you play with men? I was like, it was my job. Like, I was there to, I was there to please people. Like, my job was to be the house top and top and play with all comers, so I did. You know, does that make me somehow less straight or less, you know, it's, it's so, so strange how we can just get trapped in these identities and then we're not allowed, I'm not allowed to go to a spa, I'm not allowed to flog a guy. It's a, it's a strange thing. Uh, here, here is the Janet rant, and I'm sorry, because some, some of you have heard it before, but we are very married in this point in human history to the whole idea of sexual orientation as a thing sexual orientation is not a thing. It's, it's a cultural thing. Um, you know, there is gay culture, there is straight culture, there is bi culture. But in terms of who you are as a person, A, the whole idea of sexual orientation is based on the idea that men are one thing and women are this total other thing, where we, I think most of us know at this point in our life that most of us drift along somewhere in between those two extremes. And B, it's, it's I, I think it's inherently a monogamy centrist idea because it's posited on the fact that you're going to be with just one or maybe two or maybe three people in the course of your life, and so they're all going to be men or all going to be women. And those of us who are out there wanting to be with two or three hundred or a thousand people, <laughs> usually that's not going to be the case. We're going to want to spend at least some time with some of those people um, that might not fit into the model that we made because we believed in this weird orientation thing. It, the, the whole idea was invented in the 19th century. I think it's dying at the uh, dawn of the 21st century. And I think but by the time most of you are my age, it will be gone. So that, that's my Janet rant. <laughs> we can only hope. Yeah. Can I add something to that? Um, so there's, there's something that you brought up there that um, this idea that, uh, you know, that um, sexual orientation, that, um, how do I want to put this? Let me think. Okay, so when you say that like um, you have people attracted just to like one gender or just to another gender, it's built upon this like gender binary. It's built upon almost a fetishization of a specific gender, right? That's something I've thought about a lot. I've thought about how we basically as a society um, have decided that the only thing that's really acceptable to fetishize and objectify along is along the axis of male-female gender. You know, um, it's completely not okay to fetishize races. It's completely not okay to fetishize body type. It's completely not okay to fetishize a transgender versus cisgender statuses, right? But gender, yeah, of course, you know, I'm straight, I'm gay, what have you, right? Um, I think that um, all of these things have the same exact problem in them, which is basically when you start reducing someone down to a archetype of what this particular property of who they happen to be are, you start losing what that person is, right? Um, and that, you know, it's great to appreciate these attributes of a person, whether it's their gender, um, and that happens to be something that you find beautiful in them, or whether it's being a trans person like I am, right? Um, I don't mind if someone enjoys I'm a trans person as long as they're not objectifying me down to being a trans person. And I think that the whole concept of um, this, uh, you know, heterosexual, homosexual sort of thing, um, is just as problematic as um, you know uh, be being like um, transphobic or being a um, quote unquote um, I, I hate this word but a tranny chaser right um, it's just as problematic as that um, you know the the key is to acknowledge what things you find attractive but to see people for who they are and ex and to judge them as who they are to you as opposed to these attributes.
And especially the expectations you have associated with these attributes, right? You're femme, therefore you're going to be submissive. You're, you're masculine, therefore you're going to be strong. You know, these sort of archetypes, these stereotypes that we have about particular attributes like may not necessarily fit with people even who do have these attributes. You know, I, I've explored these terms masculine and feminine so much in recent times and they're really falling apart. Like they don't mean anything to me anymore. Like, Love, is that masculine or feminine? Family, masculine or feminine? It's like, where do we, and, and, then, and then you look at other languages where literally chairs have an A or an O at the end. Like, everything has a gender. We, we get calls. Slut has now been translated into 10 languages. And during the translation process, I get these panicky calls from the translator saying, I know you went to great pains to keep all the stories in your book ungendered, but I need to know whether this particular lover was a boy or a girl, because there's no other way to translate. Um, <laughs> are, are we going to have the, out. the singular they catch on globally in all languages? It, it, it's happening. They, they use an X instead of the A or the O in Spanish now. We, we had another question back here. And then... So, Rai, we've known each other a little while. Yeah. I have two quick comments and then a question for the panel. First comment is, I think it is awesome given the community and the audience of people here that we are this many hours into an event. And except for you using the word once, no one has said, we need to talk about how you deal with jealousy. I think that's awesome. Okay. Right? Yes. <laughs> so thank you, everyone. The second one, uh, quick comment to your, to your previous comment, Shannon, about a weirdo. So as someone who is married to a quit her job, started a company, female, female entrepreneur who was also a master level pole dancer, a polyamorist whose boyfriend just moved in and infertile. I do understand being a little bit on the outside. So thank you all for letting me be here. My question is this, since this segment has um, to a greater degree, a much greater degree than the first segment been about gender identity, sexuality, and in those types of, of discussion points, what actually caught my attention is that the two guests for this segment talked about their partners and I wanna tie back to what we left off at the end of the last one, which is this. How do you manage the great constraint, which is time? Gender, uh, sexuality, orientation, all that stuff aside, clearly each of you has more than one partner. How I, do, do I don't, deal... but okay. <laughs> Sorry, I'm, I'm talking about the segment guests. How do you deal with the one that we... Love is finite, we believe in abundance. Uh, love is not finite, we believe in abundance. All of those things. The problem is there are still only 24 hours in a day. How do you deal with that? Google Calendar. Next question. <laughs> The, the, the same way you deal with an infant at home, the same way you deal with a demanding career, we all have things in our lives that eat at our time. We all have those skills, to greater or lesser degree, to manage multiple demands on our time. If we decide to become poly, we are taking on the obligation of managing one more demand on our time, or two or three, depending on how big a slut we are. Um, <laughs> but the same time management skills that you use for your work or for your hobbies, Giving up television is a very good start, just as a hint. How, how many hours did do, that yeah. 10 years ago? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I'm not doing it, mind you. I love television, but <laughs> not, neither, neither am I trying to lead a very active sex life at this point in my life. Yeah, so um, so time management is actually absolutely an issue, and I just when I say you know Google Calendar is the answer to everything because obviously it's not, um, and uh, Janet really spoke to ha the how, uh, and I will also add that um, I find that because I don't necessarily rate my partners in terms of their value to me, their terms of like in hierarchy or uh, in terms of you know how much of my heart space that they have because my heart is infinite. 
sometimes the way that I describe my partners when I'm trying to describe whether this is somebody that I see, you know, every single day or somebody that I talk to every day or somebody that I see once a week with almost, you know, almost like almost every week uh, or somebody that I see, you know, once a month. These sort of like give a general context for the amount of space a person would take up in my life um, and sometimes use uh, sometimes um, is used as like a useful framework for describing sort of where they are positioned in the context of my overall life. Um, and it's a way that also doesn't specifically designate one as more important, but rather, hey, this person lives close by. I spend a lot of time with them. They are a lot more impactful on maybe my life decisions than this person that I maybe talk to once a week and see every couple of months. Doesn't mean that I value one over the other more, but just the amount of space that they take up does kind of matter when talking about relationships and who is in my life. Um, I, um, that's uh, one thing that you brought up, Janet, is, um, this idea that, uh, it's uh, a lot of people when they first approach the idea of time management and polyamory, they're thinking about specifically just as like, oh, well, I could never imagine like juggling time between multiple partners or what have you. Um, you juggle time, as you're saying, in every aspect of your life, right? Um, and uh, the way that I think about it, um, when you have like a demanding career, let's say, right? We, uh, if we think about a partner of someone who, let's say that um, they work at a hospital and they have long hours and that partner ends up um, feeling like a sense of neediness in that relationship, like a sense that they're not getting their needs met, they're not feeling fulfilled uh, from the amount of time that they have um, with that person. Um, that's something for them to negotiate out with that person. That's something to figure out what what works for them, what does not. Um, and it's the same thing I find in any uh, dynamic that I've had, in any relationship I've had. Like, um, it's one of the reasons why I feel that I think that one of the more important qualities that's allowed me to become more successful at being polyamorous over time has been to uh, stop um, feeling a reliance on partners of mine um, to meet needs of mine, right? I've become pretty adept at um, being able to be a whole fulfilled person by my own resources and not by the hand of a, a given partner. And that's something that I sort of, I don't know if I wanna say I insist upon it in the partners that I have in my life, but it's something that I find to be a very important, um, a very important quality to have when you are dealing with a situation in which there's time management restraints. Is to be be able to be a whole in and of yourself, even when those time needs um, do get in the way. So that's my thoughts. I think it's also true that it's very difficult for all of us who grew up in a very monogamy centrist world to escape from the monogamy-based values of time commitment being um, a criterion upon, we, um, upon which we judge the, the importance of our relationships and also duration being a criterion on which we, we judge our relationships. It can be that, you know, I, I, I spent years of my life traveling around doing BDSM in front of audiences uh, of strangers with a person I was never going to see again after that night. And some of those scenes were so intense and so loving and so brilliant. And, you know, it might be that I wouldn't even like that person if I had to live with them or if I had to spend the next day with them. Um, <laughs> but that does not make the love any less intense while it was there. Um, if Dossie and I, who have been, you know, colleagues, co-conspirators, off and on lovers, um, everything for 25 years now. Uh, a weekend together in a hotel teaching at a conference is about our limit. If we had to do more than that, there would be violence, I think. Um, <laughs> yeah, you, you can look at our hotel room and see hers with all her clothes hung in neat rows and mine that looks like a bomb went off in, in a, a luggage depot. Um, it, you know, we're, we're just not meant for that. And so some relationships by their nature are not going to be 
needing or wanting as much of your time. And to mourn the fact that you're not getting more time is missing the point. The relationship rises to the level that it wants to be at, and you just hold it there until it wants to be something else, and then you change it over to that. I've only had one live-in relationship ever, uh, besides family members in the past. Uh, I, I live alone. I intend to live alone forever. And that's something I bring up on a first date, uh, or, or sooner, if I can get it out there. Um, <laughs> Uh, because it changes the whole perception of time. We must schedule every time we see each other. And I do not have an open door policy. No one has a key to my home. I, ha I have two serious girlfriends currently and some other partners, and nobody has open access. They gotta ask permission to come over. If they just showed up, knocked on the door, I might be in the middle of fucking somebody else. They'd have to wait uh, to get in the door. So it's, it's something where Time management is uh, essential for me. Otherwise, we don't see each other. The difference and the value in, to me is that when we do see each other, it's intentional. It's quality time. We really want to be there instead of some kind of um, default situation where there's no other choice. And, and then I get to be alone when I, when I need to be, too. And usually they sleep over, and then they leave the next day. And we typically discuss... The, the time that they're going to leave because maybe I have some shit to do. You know, it's, so it's, it's time management is always an issue in any relationship. It's not unique to not non-monogamy. Uh, one thing I do find also helps with time management, particularly around a lot of, um, a lot of partners is while my nesting partner and I are not unicorn hunters. What we do find is that when we get along with or are also partners with each other's partners, it makes uh, spending time with them a lot more easy to do more often. Uh, so when we get along with each other's partners and we don't feel, you know, we can all sit together and, you know, watch a movie or have dinner together. Um, and in that way, we're, you know, able to spend more time both with each other and also with our other partners. Um, Multitasking, exactly. Uh, you know, I have a partner, for example, who, um, you know, prefers to spend one on one time exclusively with me. And so I unfortunately don't get to see her as often as I would like. Um, just because of that limitation, we still make time for it, of course. But if she were like, oh, well, yeah, we can all like, hang out and be like, okay, well, then come over, you know, this week and next week or whatever. It, it, it would be easier to do that when you all get along and and or if you are also in a relationship or in a playship or whatever with that person. Sharing time is essential among my partners as well. You know, there, was, there, were, there were years where I practiced don't ask, don't tell or use the single label. But what really changed everything was my birthday. Everyone's invited. It, it, it became a very strange thing to be like, well, we've been uh, having sex and, and dating for six months, but you're not welcome. Everyone else can come to the party except for you. It, it became this particularly disrespectful thing that I couldn't handle anymore. And so from that point, even before I started really defining as polyamorous, it was like, look, everybody's invited to my birthday. If you want to opt out, that's your choice. And then it's ramped up from there because I, I host or perform at one to five events a month in L.A. And, and, and one to five days a month is a lot. And every one of those events, my other partners might be there. They might be there with their other partner. Uh, but there's a good chance that if you can't tolerate looking at each other from across the room, we're incompatible. Yeah, my, my bo bottom line on how my partners r relate to one another, I insist on a min minimum of polite courtesy. Yeah. You know, you don't have to like each other. I don't care if you like each other. You have to be polite. It's a, it, about like my in-laws, you know? <laughs> they, they, my, my spouse does not have to like my parents. I don't li have to like his parents, but we have to be polite. We have to be friendly. And, and, and that's, I think, the minimum for, for metamors as well. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you may not want to fuck my metamors. You may not even want to, to spend time with them, but you have to be polite with them when, when you're there. Yeah. Oftentimes, our metamors are in our community as well. You know, if they were not already in there, they're in it now. Yeah. <laughs> I want to take one more question and then... We, what, what was that? My metamor just moved into my house. Yeah, move. Yeah, metamors move in. Sometimes. My long distance partner is moving from Kansas City to uh, New York in like two weeks, and I'm super excited about it. 
so we're, we're going to take one more question before we conclude this portion. Yeah? Oh, yeah, we should get the mic in there. And then we're going to have more panelists. Yeah. Thank you guys for being here so much. And thank you, Janet, for writing such an amazing, transformative book. Um, in the book, uh, you say something about um, being careful about who you're open with about being polyamorous. And I'm wondering uh, if you still would recommend that. And if so, how do we reconcile that with the emphasis on openness and honesty that's so integral to the it, it It becomes important if you have minor children, if you are in the kind of career where people are going to care if you're poly or not. Um, it's very difficult once you've told people that you're poly to go, oh, did you believe that? I was just kidding about that. Yeah. It, it's not something you can take back. So, and, and I don't want, please God, ever for someone to lose custody of their kids or lose their job because they came to a Janet Hardy panel and she said, yeah, go out and come out to everybody. So that's why I, I urge caution. And those of you who have the first edition of Ethical Slut, there are a couple floating around here, you know that I used a pseudonym. On, on the first edition, uh, Catherine A. List, which, by the way, it's a pun on Catalyst. That's what it means. Um, that was because my kids were minors at the time the first book came out. By the time the second edition came out, they were grown, and now they're older than quite a few of you here. Um, so it's, it's not an issue anymore, and Lord knows I don't do the kind of work where I can lose my job because I'm because my job is being poly. Um, <laughs> But if, if you are a school teacher or if you are a caregiver for the elderly or if you are in politics, those are conditions that I, I would be careful. The world is not yet a slut positive place. On the other hand, the more of us who can come out and do come out, the easier it gets for the folks who are left behind. Um, during the gay marriage debate, the single factor that most affected the attitude that a person, a voter, was going to have about whether gay marriage was okay or not was whether they knew any gay people. And so if we want civil rights, if we want public visibility, what's going to make that easier is a bunch of happy and functional poly people saying, hi, I'm a happy, functional poly person. Good to meet you. Um, so if you can, do. If you can't, wait for the rest of the people to get the world a little bit more, little bit more caught up with you. Oh, yeah, so um, I'm out to my family pretty much everywhere about pretty much everything. Some details I leave out, but, you know, with good reason. Um, and I do so not only for my own sanity, because keeping secrets for me is very, very hard, but also uh, for exactly that as, this, as a form of activism, because the more people come out and say, I'm queer, I'm kinky, I'm poly, and are open about it, the more people hear that and hear, oh, wait, but you're also normal. And, and also, it's okay to say these things. It's okay to, like, live your life this way. And then I've had so many people say, like, thank you for being so open about all of the aspects of yourself. And, um, and it's really helped them come into their own, explore things, give language to things, and also have the courage to come out as well. And that is, like, one of the biggest gifts I could possibly receive is knowing that I helped with that. Yeah, um... That ties a lot into what I said earlier about like um, how it's very important to me to give back to the community. And I feel like one of the ways I could do that is by being someone who um, is fortunate, uh, fortunate enough to be in a position where I'm not afraid that being who I am in the public eye is going to um, somehow detriment my life. I've been very fortunately handed a bunch of circumstances that allows me to um, not do that. Um, and so I, um, like my, my biggest goal right now is very, it's I, I want to be doing work like this. I want to be uh, doing panels like this where I, get, uh, where I get to put that out there so people can connect to that. And then also as a musician specifically, one of my biggest goals right now is, and I'm still wrapping my mind around exactly how to do this, but to create art that I can use to to bring these messages forward and to basically um, express my experiences in a way that people can connect with and give them visibility and give them visibility for the sake of, um, of both um, creating... Um, more of a public awareness about these things and an awareness that 
like I was mentioning, as uh, that um, you know, not every uh, trans narrative has to be uh, um, a tragedy. Um, but like, uh, but in addition to that, to give that, in addition to public awareness, to give people who would otherwise feel um, disempowered to be able to be themselves a chance to um, connect with that and a chance to um, feel like that can be an okay thing. So um, yeah, that's uh, that's how I feel about that personally. And and thank you, thank you everyone for for being here. And f uh, you know, this is a really big deal for me to be able to share all of this with you guys as well. I think no matter what your your particular minority group might be, which uh, identifying as non-monogamous or polyamorous is still a minority. Um, uh, I believe in 2015 there was a study that said that people who somehow identify and practice consensual non-monogamy is about 5% of Americans. Um, it's, it's, it's multiply that by 330 million people, you're talking about millions of folks, but still a minority. And there's always going to be hardship for any kind of minority group. And for me personally, I didn't really understand privilege until I was part of a minority group. I am so much in the majority in so many ways. I'm privileged in so many ways. And so once I entered this minority group, I was like, oh, I see it now. I can see all the other struggle now because of the little bit of struggle I'm dealing with. So, so I'm really thankful for some of the struggle that I have to put up with. And it's part of the reason why I put myself out there so much. It's because I, I, I think you have to use your privilege for good. And, and like Janet was saying, if you can, you should. You know, over time, if we are all in the closet, then we'll always have to deal with these hassles. And, and, and as time goes on, each decade pass, it gets better. So on that note, I'd like to wrap up this second segment. Please give a big round of applause.